Which Bible version should I use? This is a video I've been wanting to make for a while. Actually, it's probably going to be a few videos because I don't want to cover it all just in one segment. But this is a question some of you might have. All the Bible versions that are out there, which one should I use? And I want to approach this just looking at the facts today. Often there is a lot of emotion that's wrapped up in this. You know, I don't want to change what I've always had, or you guys are going liberal, or you guys are too conservative, all those kind of things. I just want to look at the facts. How did we get different versions? And there's two reasons, two main reasons why we have different Bible versions. And then at the very end, I'm going to give you my personal advice, how I came to the conclusion about which Bible version that I like to use myself. So um, which Bible which Bible version should we use? Now, I want just to set this up by imagining that you are a new Christian. You have never really heard much about the Bible, but you, um, you become saved and you're so excited you want to go and buy yourself a new Bible. And so you go into the bookstore, or at least that's how it used to be. Now you go on Amazon or whatever. But let's just, for old times' sake, say you go into a bookstore and there's all these books, all these Bibles that are lined up and and you see all kinds of colors. There's black ones, and there's brown ones, and there's blue ones, and there's maroon ones, and there's camouflage ones, and all kinds of things. And then you start looking, and you see this alphabet soup of all these different initials. You see the KJV, the NKJV, the ESV, the HCSB, uh, the NLT, on and on it goes. And you're like, I have no idea. So you grab one, and you you take it home and you're all excited about it. So you go to all your Christian friends, you say, look, I went down and I bought me a new Bible. And they look at you like you're the devil himself. You got the wrong Bible. And you had no clue. Different Bibles. How can there be all these different Bibles? Well, that is the thing that we're dealing with. There are so many versions of the Bible, and we're just talking about English here. And we need to understand, which one should we use? Are there some that are good? Are there some that are bad? So I just want to take you a few videos and help you out with this a little bit, if I can. And like I said, there are two primary reasons that we have different Bible versions that are out there. And here they are right here. I'm just going to show them to you. There's two reasons, and you have to understand these. Don't just argue uh, based on not knowing anything or this is what I like or what I don't like. Here's the two reasons that you have to understand if you are going to understand this and if you're going to argue well uh, about this subject. And here it is. Number one is the underlying text, and number two, the methods of translation. So what we're going to deal with first is the underlying text part of this, and then later we will talk about the methods of translation. And both of those together help us to understand why we have so many different translations. Now, what I ask you to do with this, with me on this, is if this is a really hot topic for you, just uh, let's approach this with, gra with grace. I'm not going to be combating with meanness, those that might not see it the same way I do. And I know it's easy on these kind of things to say, well, you're wrong. Well, I'm just going to try to get facts here, and let's have a little bit of grace. And by the way, if you want to read this out, if that's your thing, you'd rather read it on my on my website, benhammond.org. I have this all written out in a document, so if you'd rather do that, uh, please do so and comment on this video and like it if you if you like it. I guess you can dislike it if you dislike it, too. Uh, I just want to know what your opinion is on it. So let's look first at this idea of the underlying text, all right? What, what do we mean by this? The first thing we need to understand is that the Bible was not written in English. We're speaking English, we read the Bible in English, the Bible was not written in English, and that is so crucial for us to understand. Okay, so it was written down, the Old Testament was written mainly in Hebrew, there was a little bit of Aramaic in there, but mainly it was written in Hebrew, and the New Testament was written in Greek. So obviously we have the issue of going from the original languages to English, that's that's really more of the discussion under the next part that we're going to deal with, the methods of translation. How do you actually do that? But the first thing we have to understand is, how, how did we get to where we are now? It, it, sometimes we think, well, they ha we have the original manuscripts that they wrote, and people copy them, and they change things, and that's why we have different versions. But it's not quite that clear, because we don't actually have the original manuscripts anymore. By the way, the original manuscripts, we call them autographs. A-U-T-O, graphs, autographs, because those are the ones that the actual people sat down and literally wrote on. The ink that they wrote is actually on those autographs. Uh, and they're the ones that Paul wrote, Moses, whatever. They, those are the actual ones. The problem is 
we don't have those anymore, okay? They didn't have computers. They didn't have typewriters. They didn't even have copy machines. They actually sat down, they wrote these things by hand, and then they had to be copied by hand. And I think it'd be, in some ways, it'd be so much easier if we actually had those autographs, if we actually had them and we could go back and compare what we have in English with those. The problem is we don't have them anymore. They're nowhere, they don't exist anymore. Why? Why did God not allow us to still have the autographs? And I was thinking about this, and I came up with a few reasons why I think that maybe God does not allow us to have those autographs anymore. And one is that, obviously, well, first of all, they've been destroyed. Okay, this is what happened to them. Sometimes they were destroyed. They could have been confiscated by authorities. Um, they could have um, been just, somebody didn't like them, so they just destroy them. I mean, they're just gone, okay? Uh, another reason why we don't have them anymore is they probably just got old and disintegrated. I mean, they didn't have all these modern ways of keeping old documents around, and so they just got old. A few years ago, we went to Washington, D.C., and we were able to see the United States Constitution. I mean, that is really cool. Well, that's, that's only, you know, two, three hundred years old, something like that. So it's not like um, it's thousands of years old. We have ways of keeping these so they don't fall apart now, and they didn't have that when the Bible was written. And so things started to fall apart. And I just want to show you a couple of pictures here. These are, um, this is what is called papyrus. Um, especially when we get to the New Testament documents, some of them are written on papyrus, which was the Biblus read, B-Y-B-L-U-S, um, uh, okay? Ultimately from that where we get the word like uh, bibliography or book, Okay, and so they would take this reed and they would dry it out and they would flatten it and they would come up with papyrus and they would roll this up and that was a scroll. Well, you can see that this just isn't going to last forever. It doesn't have the chemicals that we put in things that make it last forever. So it's going to be destroyed. And then along came parchment, which was animal skins, and they would actually be able to make something that looked more like a book, and they would call it a codex or codices. They would take and put these into book form, and they would be very similar to our books. But these are not going to last long. These animal skins and these reeds, they're not going to last. Uh, they're not going to last forever, so we just don't have them anymore. So the question I have is, why would God allow these to be destroyed? If these would settle a lot of our discussion about Bible versions, why did God not allow us to keep them? And I think there are a couple of reasons why God did not allow them. And I think one of the primary reasons might be that if we had the actual writings of the biblical writers, people would probably begin to worship them. I mean, can't you see that? We even have examples of that in the Bible. A Gideon, when he, he led the Israelites on to this great defeat of their enemies, he made an ephod of gold. And uh, eventually people started to worship this thing. Uh, and we see this stuff all the time. We see Moses' serpent, the brass snake that he put up on the pole, and people, if they were go look at it, they would live after being bitten by the snakes when they were whining and griping and complaining. And people started to worship that thing, and they had to destroy it. So we see these kind of uh, we see these kind of things going on. So if we had these these actual autographs, people would put them up somewhere in a church or in a museum, and they would start pretty much worshiping these things. So maybe that's why God did not allow us to have them anymore. Simple fact is we don't have them. So part of people making the Bible, putting it in other languages, and translating it comes from which text do I have? I don't have the originals. So what do I translate from Hebrew or Greek into English? And it's not a really easy, real easy question to answer because there's not just one text. There are many, and they vary in some ways, and we're going to talk about what that is. So I want to discuss just a little bit about the Old Testament. The New Testament is, is where the biggest fight comes in, okay? But the Old Testament text um, is kind of interesting, though, and we don't have a lot of as much anyway, discussion about what texts the, the Old Testament should be translated from. The Old Testament, the Hebrew autographs, were all completely written around four to 500 BC. So there's about 400 years between the two testaments in the Bible. And so around four to 500 BC is when the final book in the Old Testament was written. In the meantime there, after that was written, and before the New Testament comes, and you have more of a Greek and a Greek-speaking culture, um, the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek in 2300 BC. Over time, they begin to translate these into Greek, and basically that is what we know as the Septuagint. 
Uh, now the Septuagint, I'm going to show you this right here. It's often known as, um, oh, let me get that. It's often known as the LXX. And the reason for that is um, because there were about 70 people that translated it. Now it's kind of an interesting story here. And a lot of it's fanciful. It's hard to know exactly what was going on. But there was what's called the letter of Aristeus, which is a second century BC letter that describes how the Septuagint came to be, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. And there's some over glorification, some grandeur in it. But basically, the idea is that Aristeus himself claimed to have convinced the king, who was Ptolemy II, Philadelphus of Alexandria, not only to free some Jewish slaves, but to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. Now, this king had this great library that he was really proud of, and he um, he said, if we're going to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, we want it to be the very best. And so the story is that he wrote to the high priest in Jerusalem, Eliezer, and he said, send me uh, six uh, uh, elders from each of your tribes, that would be 72, send them to me, and they I'll have them translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And so the story is that he sent about 70, 72 uh, of these scholars over, and they translated it. And this is where the story gets a little bit maybe embellished, because the story is that they put all of these these uh, Hebrew elders in different rooms, and they translated from Greek uh, from Hebrew to Greek, and when they came out, everything they had translated exactly the same. Now, you know, there, there's some embellishments, and we don't really know exactly that's what happened, but that's the story. But we do know that the Septuagint was very highly regarded in early Christianity. Um, there's some debate about it, obviously, like there's debate about everything. Uh, but the Septuagint is very important, partly because it helps us understand how the Jews interpreted at that time, the Hebrew scriptures. So it helps the uh, scholars in that way. Uh, it preserves the early or the translations of the early Hebrew texts. Most of our Bibles, the Old Testament, is translated from what is called the Masoretic text, and that came in like 600 to 1000 AD. Well, the Septuagint was translated back uh, before the AD era, back to 300 BC. So it gives an idea how they interpreted the scriptures back then when they translated it. Um, some of the New Testament authors, our scholars say, actually quoted from the Septuagint. Some people think that Jesus used the Septuagint, even though there are people who disagree with that. But it just, it's just a very important translation from Hebrew into Greek. And so then we have the Masoretic text. Okay, and this is really where our Old Testament uh, translations, uh, this, this is what's important here. The Masoretic text was translated about the 6th to the 10th century A.D., and what you had is a group of, of Jewish scribes, and they were called the Masoretes, and they were very meticulous about taking, because what would happen is you had all these Hebrew manuscripts as they copied by hand. There got to be so many of them all over, and they were saying, well, they're starting to vary as different manuscripts get sent to different places in the world. They start to have changes. People, when they're copying by hand, they make mistakes, and so they tried to compile them all together instead of having for sake of argument, 100 manuscripts, let's narrow it down to one or two, something like that, okay? So they would take all these and compile them and say, well, we think that reading is wrong and that was right, whatever. And they would try to, to, to compile them and do it right, and they would copy these things by hand, and they were so meticulous. As a matter of fact, if you ever heard about Hebrew vowel pointings and things, what this is, is a Hebrew language is made up of consonants only. There are no vowels. And so when you read it, you have to know how to say the word, and so what the Masoretes did was they said, well, we are understanding, because ancient Hebrew is more of a dead language, our, our understanding is how this is how you say the word, and it's not going to be preserved for future generations. And so they would add dots and lines before and above the consonants, and as you read it and it's read backwards, uh, it would tell you how to say the word, okay? And so what they did, they did it that way, partially because as they would copy it, sometimes they would actually count all the letters on the page that they were copying and the one they were copying from and to make sure they matched. It was just one of the ways of making sure I did not make any mistake when copying these scriptures over. So they were very meticulous about this. And it's interesting that when the um, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, which date from, you know, the first century AD and even before, they were found to be very much in line with what the Masoretes had copied six, seven, eight hundred, a thousand years later. So the Masoretes were very, very good at what they did. And most of our Bibles, the Old Testament, is translated from 
the Masoretic text. Now, of course, not just one Masoretic text. That'd be easier, but there isn't. So here's just a list of the different um, versions, if we could say, of the Masoretic text that our Bibles are translated from. But like I said, this basically is not the big problem. This isn't where we get our fights about what text we should use. The New Testament, though, that is where we have um, some problems. And so I want to look at the New Testament just a little bit here and see the history of the New Testament text is much more convoluted. But one thing we need to do is we need to understand a definition, and it is text types. A text type. What is a text type? A text type is a group of similar texts. See, what happens is as people would begin to copy Paul's writings or Peter's writings or Matthew or whoever, they copy and send it to different places. As it got sent out to different places around the world, when people began to copy, if someone actually accidentally made an error, that error might be copied in further ones. And so you see, as they get to different areas, then uh, the, the errors are going to be spread out all over the place. And so we begin to see, scholars begin to see as they study, well, the texts that come from this area, they have these differences opposed to this area over here. And so we're going to call this one text type, and we're going to call this one text type. It's almost like even in English, we have um, accents. People that live in the South speak differently than people that live in the North. And so, so that's the kind of thing that happens. So as these copies of the New Testament text, the manuscripts, start getting sent out all over the place, you start to see some similar errors that are showing up. And similarly, some things are added in some areas, some things are taken away. And we're trying to figure out what did the autographs actually say? That's called textual criticism, trying to find it out. So we have basically three divisions of Greek text types in the New Testament. And um, here is a picture, if I can show you this one, of basically the Roman Empire. What happened was in 395 AD, Emperor Diocletian divided the Roman Empire between the East and the West. And in the West... Latin, in the western part there, Latin became the basic language that was used. So obviously they were translating into Latin and then disseminating their scriptures in Latin. Well, that doesn't enter into our discussion because we're not interested in looking at what the Latin ones say. We want to know what the Greek ones say because it was originally written in Greek. So that doesn't really enter much into our conversation. But over in the east, and what is the arrow is on the Byzantine Empire there, that is very important because those people translated or copied the scriptures prolifically. They, they would copy and copy and send them off and copy and doing all this by hand. So there are many, many um, uh, manuscripts, Greek manuscripts of the New Testament that are found in Byzantine. All right, so that's called the Byzantine Empire. Uh, that's over there. And then down the south is around uh, Africa uh, in Egypt. And that is called Alexandrian. And there, there are some manuscripts from there, not as many as the Byzantine, but generally the ones they found down there are thought to be older. They've been able to, because of the climate, they've been able to stay around a long time. So there's are basically our three text types. The Western text type doesn't really enter our conversation much here. We're more interested in the Byzantine text type and the Alexandrian text type. So I just want to make a note about the Alexandrian text type. There's mainly three that enter into our conversation here. Notable Alexandrian texts, Codex Alexandrinus, a Codex Vaticanus, and Codex Sinat uh, Sinaticus. All right, now the Codex Sinaticus there, that has kind of an interesting history, and this is what happened. Um, Constantine, uh, let me get his name right, von Tingendorf, I think, he, um, he decided, I'm going to try to compile many Greek texts together, and I'm going to try to, you know, take all the differences and see if I can figure out what the originals actually said based on these. So he started on this search to find as many old Greek manuscripts as he possibly could. So he went down to the Monastery of St. Catherine at Mount Sinai, and he was looking around and, you know, trying to find old things, and he came to this trash bin as the story goes, he came, found, found this trash bin of things that were waiting to be burned, and he found s uh, some uh, leaflets of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. And he says, wow, this is pretty cool. So he started to take them, and then suddenly the people in the monastery were like, wait a minute, this guy's really interested. This might be something of worse, so they didn't let him take anymore. Uh, well, he came back, and that was in 18... Um, 1844. In 1859, he came back with blessing from the emperor of Russia, 
And so they allowed him to get back in and he started looking. He tried to find that document. He couldn't find it anywhere. He searched and searched, couldn't find it. Well, the day before he was getting ready to leave, a steward that worked there in the monastery came to him and said, hey, I understand that you're looking for this uh, old Septuagint. You know, and I, I, I have an old Septuagint. And not only do I have that, but there's more to it. And and he thought, wow, this is interesting. So he went to see, and he found this guy had the exact document he was looking for. Not only was it the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, but the New Testament was also there. The whole Bible was there. And you could see that Tenzendorf was obviously very, very excited about this. And that document is what we have now known as Codex Sinaiticus. Now, the reason I talk about that is because some people will say, they'll argue, they say, well, that can't be trusted, even though it's considered to be older, 4th century AD, than all of our Byzantine manuscripts, but they say it's, well, for goodness sakes, he found a trash pile, so people didn't think it was worth anything. It was just garbage. Well, I would counter that because I think that as soon as they realized how much tension Zorf wanted this thing, they realized there was value. Somehow it got put in the trash heap and shouldn't have been there, right? So I don't think that that's enough argument to say that uh, this was just junk and they threw it out because they knew it was a trash copy. So, I mean, you can make your own decision on that, but, but these are the three most popular uh, popular manuscripts that come from the Alexandrian text type. Again, the Alexandrian text type is thought to be older than the Byzantine text type, but there are many, many more copies of the Byzantine text type just simply because those people translated uh, a whole lot more than the Alexandrian. This is very, very important. We try to understand uh, how what texts we're supposed to be translating from. Now, one thing we have to realize, we have all these texts that are out there in the, in the text, you know, the different text types. What, what's going on? Why are they so different? And the difference comes because when they would copy by hand, like I said, no copy machines or any, no computers, they would make some mistakes. Someone accidentally might leave something off and they weren't meticulous enough to make sure that it was exactly like the original was. Uh, sometime uh, something might get torn off and the next guy copying wouldn't realize it. Sometime they might put a little note in the, in the margin and the next guy would think, well, maybe that's part of the text and he'll put it in there. Those kind of things. That's why we have differences in the text. And the scholars tell us that really the differences are not major. You know, we can freak out. Wow, we don't even know what the Bible is because it's all different, right? No, these are not, we don't lose major doctrines. And in some cases, it might even be like a chapter or a few verses or maybe just the way the wording is or, you know, just minor differences that aren't that big of a deal. But that's why they're so different. And that's why uh, we have different text types because in this, like in Byzantine, if, if somebody made an error and sent that copy up to Byzantine, and people started to copy it, they're going to copy that error, probably, if they didn't figure it out, as opposed to someone down in Alexandria who had a different error. Okay, so you kind of see how these text type works. That's where textual criticism comes in. Textual criticism is what happens when these scholars sit down, and they have all these documents, which they keep finding. And they have all these documents, and, and they're saying, okay, let's put them together, and let's try to use our scientific methods of figuring out what did the originals actually have to say. And there's many ways they do that. And I'm going to talk about that in the next video because it's a little bit more, uh, more than I want to get into in this video. But this is just very important before we get into textual criticism to understand why we have to do textual criticism. And it's because we have all these different texts that are out there, and there's some differences in them, and we want to find out what actually the original said the best that we possibly can because we don't have those originals. So I hope this was understanding to you. And as soon as I make the next video and post it, I'll put it in the comments for you. So I hope you enjoyed this. Let me know what you think of it. I love your opinions. So we work through this together. And but above everything else, don't forget to read your Bible and don't forget to obey it or it's not going to do you any good. Don't argue about Bible versions if you're not reading the one you have. All right. Take care. God bless. And I'll see you next time.